So I'm going to talk about methods in pharmacovigilance. So this I have to do for your, for your course leaders. So these are the objectives. So after this course, uh, this lecture, I hope that you will know a bit more about methods and when you can apply the different methods. Okay, so I will talk about uh, targeted spontaneous reporting. I will talk about uh, spontaneous reporting. I will also talk a little about cohort event monitoring. So there are different ways to monitor the safety of, of um, drugs. Um, and I like this quote very much. It's from uh, Donald Rumsfeld. I don't like him very much. But uh, he says, um, there are known unknowns, and also things we know that we know, known unknowns, things that we are aware that we don't know. But there are, there are also things that we don't know that we don't know. And I think this illustrates, it's a very good quote also for pharmacovigilance. So the known knowns, that would be the adverse drug reactions that we identify in clinical trials, these are things that we know that they exist. There are also things that we know that we don't know. That can, can be certain things that you might suspect could occur based on the pharmacological mechanism of the drug or based on what you have seen in animal studies. And there are also things that you don't know that you don't know. And depending on what you are looking at in pharmacovigilance, you can choose a method. So what would you say is spontaneous reporting particularly good in finding? Yes? Yes? Seri rare adverse reactions, serious adverse reactions, yes? Uh, that would be difficult with spontaneous reporting, as you don't know how, how much underreporting you have, and you don't have the denominator. So, but uh, I, in my view, f um, it's very good at uh, detecting the unknown unknowns. So, for example, when we identified when pharmacovigilance identified a narcolepsia yeah, with a flu vaccine, it was something that we had no idea that it could even occur. We were totally out of the blue. So that's also good to think about when you want to use a method, what do I want to find with it? Because that, dep that uh, sets, uh, decides on what method you can choose. In uh, post-marketing surveillance, you also have two different kinds of methods that you can use. Uh, some are based on generating a hypothesis. So those methods will give you an idea of what can I possibly suspect to be an ADR. Um, and the second one are those that will confirm that there are uh, hypotheses. Sometimes I make also this division that pharmacovigilance does a lot of the hypothesis generation. So we say, here, look here, it can be something wrong here. And the pharmacoepidemiological people do more of the confirmation, where they really put a numeric measure on what a risk is or something. Within the spectrum of hypothesis generation, you have different methods that you can use. So I would say, and they go from, in this sheet, they go from um, unstructured to more structured form. And if you look for, uh, at it from an epidemiological point of view, spontaneous reporting is the least structural form. But because it's quite unstructured, it gives you the chance to uh, identify things that you didn't think about yourself. Um, then a bit more structured is I intensified uh, ADR reporting. A bit more is the targeted spontaneous reporting. And the cohort event monitoring starts moving in the direction, sometimes also hypothesis uh, confirmation. So today, I will talk mostly about these methods. But I, I, I guess you had Tuan Egberts. Uh, have you had Tuan Egberts? Yes. So he has probably talked to you maybe a bit about this. No? OK. Well, he's an epidemiologist also. But uh, in the hypothesis confirmation step, you have more methods than can really confirm an hypothesis. So that with these measures, you can get a, a risk measure out of these studies. And also here you have from, um, I don't want to say least value, but 
case, case control studies have less, sometimes less power than cohort studies. And randomized control tri trials, of course, very, very strict. And meta-analysis is the higher le high, highest level of evidence. So also there you have sort of ranking in evidence. Although I don't like the world ranking because I think for certain questions you only have one option to choose because it's not possible for you to get the data in any other ways. But I will not talk so much about these methods. But I, I think there are other people maybe who will do. It will be next week, yes. So then you can already say it, you know, some things. Um, so if we start with the spontaneous reporting system. So what is really a spontaneous reporting system? Because if you work in pharmacovigilance, you're very busy in the processes or surrounding your system. But maybe you haven't had the time to think about what can my system do? And I think spontaneous reporting is, of course, a system to monitor the safety of all medicines on the market. And that's what makes it different from other methods, because they only monitor selected drugs. This is a system that monitors all the drugs available on the market in your country. And it relies on voluntary submission of um, ICSRs, that is individual case safety reports, or just reports of ADRs, by health uh, care professionals, in some countries also pharmaceutical manufacturers, and patients to the national centers. And this voluntary submission is also, I think, something to think about, because the system only works if people are willing to submit their reports. So it means that they have to know that there is such a system, and they also have to come into action to actually um, submit the reports. So it, it sounds very simple, this, as a very simple um, system, but I think the challenges here, and I don't know what your experience are, but the challenges here are to get the engagements from the people that you want information from. And if you look at it, this is a bit how it looks like. Um, so you have your report here. Oh, this is, doesn't matter. So usually you can have reports in many different ways. Sometimes you still have paper-based reports and sometimes you have reporting forms that directly um, enters the report into your database. Um, then you would have coding and assessment. So in order to be able to perform signal detection, you have to do coding. And I think you have had VigiFlow sessions this far. And then sometimes people underestimate the importance of the coding. <laughs> but it's very, very important how you code your report, because that determines how you can retrieve your data later. So that actually determines how good you can do your signal detection <coughs> later. So always think about when you choose a code very carefully. And then you put all these uh, um, reports in your database, and then you can perform signal detection and uh, produce signals. And signal detections can be uh, in smaller centers as ours. We still do case by case signal detection. That means that we look at every report and we see, oh, does this contain anything new that we didn't know before? And do I have any other reports in my database that support it? Or you can do as the UMC does, they let the statistics help you to make a selection and then they look back to the case series. A question that we often get from reporters is, what do they, you want us to report? What is your question, answer to that if reporters ask that? Everything. Everything, Everything. okay. Yes, of course. Well, I, I'm not really sure if you want everything, but I, I think it's a very, very diff uh, difficult uh, 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 question to answer. I think it's very difficult to answer it because sometimes you have legal obligations. So sometimes m uh, reporting is mandatory in a country. So then you cannot say as a center, we don't want everything. Um, but usually it's good for them to report serious ADRs because they cause most harm. But also severe ADRs, because the severity of ADRs sometimes uh, influences very much how adherent patients are to their treatment, especially in the TB field where you have very long treatment periods 
and where adherence is very important. It's very, very important to make sure that people feel that they can continue taking their drugs. Um, sometimes people prompt that you uh, report on new drugs or newer drugs. Sometimes unknown uh, reactions that hasn't been known yet. And also sometimes ADRs in special groups like children, pregnant women or the elderly. But because it is a spontaneous system, you don't want to be steering too much toward reporting certain things. Because you want it to be an open reporting tool where people can actually uh, report the unknown. So I think that's if you specify too much what you report, then you lose this feeling of getting the unknown. But still you want to give the healthcare professionals some guidance in what to report. Because usually I get a question, oh, you want us to report everything. Do you want me to report every bleeding or warfarin? And it's a difficult question to, to answer because bleedings are usually serious. But bleedings and warfarin is very well known. So do I want to burden my healthcare professional to report those? Or do I want him to spend his time on reporting something that is really new and unknown, maybe? Tricky questions. Some countries... Uh, this is from uh, the UK, they also have some sort of guidance uh, on how to report, but eventually you come out that you should report everything. But it's, yeah, it's important to think about how you communicate what to report without restricting then the inventiveness of the reporter. So um, I wanted also to discuss with you what is spontaneous reporting good at, because Sometimes we do get a lot of criticism. We say, oh, you in pharmacovigilance, you are not so very scientific. You only do spontaneous reporting, which is totally uncontrolled. And yes, it is totally uncontrolled, but that's also one of its strengths. So what are the pros with spontaneous reporting? Well, it covers the whole population. And when you do more targeted spontaneous reporting and cohort event monitoring, you only target a certain population of the country and not the whole country but a true spontaneous reporting covers uh, the whole population and as I said also covers all medicines and it also gives it it's not only a temporary monitoring of the medicines as targeted spontaneous reporting or a court event monitoring but it monitors the drug throughout the life cycle because sometimes we think oh and it's more important to monitor in the beginning but in the end of the life cycle nothing will happen but still we identify a lot of signals with drugs that have been on the market for like 10 years. So it's not that after 10 years we know everything. We still continue to learn new things from these drugs. So important to be able to monitor through the whole life cycles. And also very good, as, uh, as you said, to detect uh, signals of the new, rare and serious ADRs. It's also the most commonly used method. And I think it's because it's the method that is easiest to establish. Because as I said, on paper it looks very easy, but it's very difficult to create a pharmacovigilance cultures among healthcare professionals and patients to actually make them report to you. Uh, it's also very um, not so labor intensive as, for example, cohort event monitoring. And it's also because it's not so labor uh, intensive, it's also quite uh, inexpensive to establish. So it's easy and cheap which makes it, I think, a good starting point for most countries. So, but there are also, of course, disadvantages with spontaneous reporting. And uh, one of the disadvantages that is only, uh, is the most often uh, uh, talked about is under-reporting. Oh, how can you say anything about the safety of drug because most adverse drug reactions go under-reporting. And studies show that about um, only 5% of all, uh, all uh, ADRs occurring actually are reported. But I think it also has a positive side because when you ask healthcare professionals in particular but also patients to report what they find is important, they make a first selection for you. So they say, I think this is important enough to tell you. So they make a pre-selection for you on what is important. And I, I know Rafe Edwards says that it's the clinical concern. So they share their clinical concerns with us. So maybe under-reporting can be negative, but I think you can turn it around and say we get concerned reporting. So we get the cases where people have concern. 
of course it only captures um, uh, symptoms or ADRs where people suspect that there is a relation. So if people would never suspect a relation, we would never get the report. Um, in a signal detection activity that I did with the UNC two years ago, uh, we had some report where patients said, well, I've been suffering from panic attacks and I, I was feeling very bad and went to the doctor, but I didn't think there was a link with my drug. But then I stopped the drug for another reason and then my panic attack disappeared. So she, she didn't put the link that it could be an ADR. So if people don't put the link that something is an ADR, then of course they will never report it. Also when you have reporting, when it comes back to the concerned reporting, you have reporting biases. So some uh, type of reports are more likely to be reported than others. For example, serious reports or very severe reports, new medicines. But also, for example, if there's a lot of uh, advertising for a product so that the use goes up in your population, that can also stimulate reporting on that drug. And what we notice very much, and maybe it's also the same in your countries, if there's an item on TV about a certain drug or a certain side effect, then we know for sure in the following days that we will get a lot of reports on that drug. But a colleague of mine, Florence, I think you met her earlier this week, she talked about patient reporting. She did a study to see if um, selective reporting because of media attention influences your ability to detect signals in the database and she found that it didn't uh, affect it. So it's, it is a problem in the sense that you might be able to process a lot of, have to process a lot of reports uh, at once, but it doesn't really affect your signal detection capabilities. So one of the most often cited cons with spontaneous reporting is that we cannot um, calculate incidence rates. So you can never say that because something is um, reported very often, it means that it has a high incident. Usually there are other factors explaining why something is reported very often. Because if something is very rare and serious, people will report it. So you will maybe have more rare and serious events but it doesn't mean that they are very prevalent in the population. So I think it's very important to interpret how you can in communicate the number of reports, what it means to have a huge number of reports. And spontaneous reporting is not very good at detecting certain types of ADR. There are, for example, delayed ADRs. For example, if you develop cancer when you use certain drugs, or if you have used lithium for very many years and you get uh, a kidney um, uh, deficiencies, they are not very good at being detected with this system. And also ADR with a very high background incidence is difficult to identify because causality assessment will be more difficult uh, to do. So despite all the criticism on, pharma uh, on the spontaneous reporting, this is from a study from a Dutch uh, person who works at the, uh, the Dutch uh, Drug Regulatory Authorities. She has looked at the signals that were discussed at the PRAC, and that's the highest decision-making organ in the European Union concerning pharmacovigilance. And she looked, where does the evidence come from where decisions have been made from? So even though people say, well, spontaneous reporting, <laughs> still uh, in 62% of all cases where decisions were made, they were made based on data from spontaneous reporting. So still a very, very powerful tool. And you see, for example, um, randomized controlled trial or observational studies, only 10% or 8% of all decisions were made on this. So still it's a very, very important tool in the decision making around drugs. Are there any questions so far? So I will move to the newer forms. Um, and that's the intensified uh, uh, spontaneous reporting. Um, I think this concept comes from the UK. I, I saw there was someone from the UK here on the flags in the back. They had a black triangle uh, program. So, so they really thought, well, for some drugs, we would like to have more information. So they say, we will put a black triangle on this and see if people will report and encourage people to report more on this. Um, so that's what we call intensified spontaneous reporting. It's sort of extension, but it's not very, it's not dif different than spontaneous reporting, but you prompt uh, healthcare professionals and patients to report more on special drugs. 
So a few years ago, the European medicines agencies thought, well, that concept is quite good. We should spread it also to Europe. So they turned the tri black triangle around. So now it looks like this. And they call their concept additional monitoring. Um, I must say, personally, I think the UK, or the MHRA in the UK, had a quite small list. So it was a list people could remember, and so it was quite effective in remembering all of this drug. Uh, the list of drugs under additional monitoring, you can find it on the website from the EMA, but it's very extensive, very, very extensive. So it's difficult to, um, to remember, and also sometimes also to see, if it is under additional monitoring. For example, all biological drugs are on this list, but a lot of these are given as infusions, so patients don't see the black triangle. The nurse that gives the drug doesn't see that there's a black triangle. So although I think it has potential, the concept, I don't, I don't, at least in my setting, I have not felt that this has been a very successful implementation. So when you do targeted spontaneous reporting, it's possible to target a specific population, for example, pregnant women or children, or you can target specific clinics, for example, a TB clinic and an HIV clinic. Um, you could target specific medicines that are distributed in these clinics, so you can target all medicines distributed in the clinics. Uh, and you can choose to target all ADRs or target specific ADRs. <coughs> so if we talk about the tuberculosis drugs, I don't know how many of you have national tuberculosis programs. <coughs> how many of you are using the short regimens and new drugs? <coughs> yes. <laughs> but there, for example, they have very uh, they have chosen a specific population, which is the population with um, patients having multi-resistant uh, tuberculosis. Um, I don't know in all kinds, but sometimes they go to special clinics because not all clinics have the possibility because you have to do a lot of monitoring of these patients. So maybe not so they have special clinics. Then they are very interested in bedaquiline or the safety of bedaquiline because it's a new drug. And depending on the package ADSM that you choose, you target special ADRs, so uh, serious ADRs, and they also have a predefined list of adverse events of special interest. So if you look at it that way, I think ADSM is really a targeted spontaneous reporting. <laughs> so there you see it. Uh, I thought I saw someone from Uganda here as well. Yes, hello. My next example is from Uganda, because you have also been doing spontaneous, uh, targeted spontaneous reporting. Yes. Have you been involved in these uh, studies? Maybe wait for the microphone, Nadia is coming. Uh, no, I've not been directly involved. Mm -hmm. It was mainly done by Madame Helen and mm -hmm. Victoria. Mm -hmm. yeah, those were directly involved. Yes. Yeah. But the Uganda National Center is very um, uh, involved in using these new methodologies to uh, to conduct research. And I also saw recently they have published in Drug Safety again about the study that you've done. But this is a bit of an older study, it's from 2015. And there they introduced targeted spontaneous reporting um, of antiretrovirus in, uh, in Uganda. So the specific population in this study was patient with HIV infection. Um, and then they also had a special, the location were specific clinics. So they had chosen two regional pharmacovigilance center clinics, where you also have a regional center. So they say, well, we will look at patients with HIV in these two clinics. Then the were specific, what, what drugs do we want to look at all HIV drugs? Or do we want to look for special drugs? And then they thought, no, we want to look at tenofovir. And then was the question, do we want to look at all ADRs or do we want to look at specific ADRs? And they want, were specifically interested in renal toxicity. So this is how they uh, built up their targeted simultaneous reporting. So they had a, a question, which was probably, what if we want to know more about renal toxicity of tenofovir. 
and they thought spontaneous reporting will give us too little evidence. So it's not a good method. So then I started thinking, how can we make a model where we can actually get this information that we need? So they built this targeted spontaneous reporting in these two clinics. So what did they find when they did this? Because targeted spontaneous reporting, if you confined it to specific clinics, you already know how many people are treated in those clinics. So you can actually calculate a sort of incidence. So in this case, the incidence of um, renal to toxicity was one in 200. It was also very good, even though they were focusing on renal toxicity. It also led to, an, uh, to more reporting of serious ADRs. It also gave them information about the treatment duration of these patients. So how long were patients actually treatment treated? And because they collected this information, um, they also saw that long treatment duration, more than four years, raised creatinine levels in patients. And as a result of this targeted spontaneous reporting intervention, they also saw that a normal spontaneous reporting increased in these particular areas. So that was an extra plus, I think, which they hadn't calculated on, but which is very nice. So it also shows if you have more targeted activities in some areas, it would also be good for your general pharmacovigilance awareness. So what are the pros that we use the targeted spontaneous uh, reporting? One of the pros is, of course, that you can utilize the existing ADR reporting in infrastructure. Although you might want to consider if you want to get, give modifications or the reporting form so you can capture the information that you need. You can target uh, specific medicines of interest. Uh, and it's possible to implement a monitoring program that targets specific issues of concern. Um, it also helps you to tunnel the information that you want. So it only captures the information that you wanted to capture. That's also sometimes a disadvantage. As I noticed with the ADSM, that people are very concerned about the predefined events that might not even think about that other symptoms that occur that they can also be ADRs because they are very, very focused on the events that they should be also should be focused on. Uh, and if you do it in selective clinics, then you also know the denominator. So then you can actually calculate incidences. But also with TSR and with all spontaneous reporting, you do have a problem with underreporting because you don't know if all, all the cases that happen actually are reported to you. Um, and it's also, if you pre-specify what you are going to look for, if you select certain types of ADRs, it can only capture um, the known knowns or the known unknowns, but it can never capture the unknown unknowns because you don't ask them, you cannot ask them to, to catch uh, so it limits the reporting to very specific ADRs. And of course, as with all ADRs, it relies on the diagnostic capability of the report. So if you are, and I, under, I have understood, but I have very little experiences myself, that in some setting, the concept of targeted spontaneous reporting is increasing, that more and more countries want to apply these methods. So I just put in for you um, a few references here that you can read. Um, if you don't have access to these um, uh, journals, or you would like to read this paper, uh, if you drop me an email, I can see if I can share them with you. So then we will go past to the last one, if there are not any other questions about targeted spontaneous reporting. So when we talked about targeted spontaneous reporting, do any of you now have the feeling, oh, maybe I'm I'm doing some targeted spontaneous reporting, but you didn't recognize the term as such. Anyone? No? <laughs> okay. Um, so I will move to the last method that I was going to discuss today. And I think I have about a quarter, so we'll see how we'll make it time-wise. Uh, so um, what is the primary aim of cohort event monitoring? That is to gather more information on the safety profile of a new chemical entity in early post-marketing phase. And as our colleague from Ghana said, it's an observational cohort studies design. So observational means that you do not in any way influence um, the decision if a patient is going to use the drug or not. 
So you only observe when that choice has been made by your doctor. You only observe what it what is happening. And a cohort is just a fancy word for a group. And um, what you then do is that you try to include patients in your group. So you have to have certain inclusion points. And also as the colleague from Ghana said that you were using some regional centers with a strong PV presence as the place to recruit patients to your cohort or your group. And then you actively follow them up during the treatment. In, in your case, you did it by phone. Some people do that by web-based solutions, and some people just ask people to come back also to the clinic. It depends very much on the setting that you are in, which kind of collection me the, uh, methods you can use. And the difference between cohort event monitoring and all forms that have the name spontaneous in it is that you don't only record events that you think are related to the drug. So in cohort event monitoring, you include all events that are happening. And you don't have to make a decision if you think it's related to the drug or not. And it uh, looks a bit like this. So here you have recruited all your patients. And they will get a drug. And then some will develop adverse event at certain points in time. And you can choose if you want only to have one measure. Or maybe you want to measure how they are feeling at several different points in time. I don't know, did you measure at several points in time? Two points in time, yes. So depending on the type of drug that you are monitoring, you can choose how many times afterwards you want to follow up with the patients. So what can you do with cohort event monitoring? Um, because you have a cohort, most of the events that you will uh, find will probably be known ADRs because they are most frequently occurring. Um, but it can help you to characterize known reactions. It can give you an incidence, it can give you uh, information about when it's occurring, uh, it can give you certain information. So I think that's also one of the strengths, which I think spontaneous reporting is a bit not so good, that is to characterize known reactions. But it still also have the potential to detect signals of unrecognized reactions. So you can still use normal signal detection uh, methodology on these uh, data sets. Um, it can also identify interactions with other medicines and also traditional um, medicines. Uh, it can also be good at detective inefficacy of medicines because you have a large cohort that uses the same uh, drug. Uh, I also think this is one of the methods that you can use to assess safety in pregnancy and lactation because pregnant women are never included in any studies. Um, there's not so much reported in spontaneous reporting systems about pregnant women and drug use. So if you have the possibility, if you're doing cohort, then you can really get this information, which I think is also very, very vital information. And also you can identify risk factors for ADR. So there are certain characteristics that makes people more prone to develop a certain ADR. So that are things that you can do with the well-designed uh, cohort event monitoring. I think it's also important to say, well, maybe I'll come to it later, that it's very, very time consuming and resource consuming. So at uh, my center, we also have um, a cohort event monitoring program that we run, and we call it the LARAB Intensive Monitoring. Other very famous or well-known cohort event monitoring programs is the Prescription Event Monitoring, which is uh, maintained by the Drug Safety Research Unit in the UK. And also in New Zealand, they previously had uh, the Intensive Monitoring Medicines program, which uh, sadly has been closed. But the aim of our intensive monitoring program is to gather knowledge about ADRs. So that's really to characterize ADRs more. And our aim with getting this extra information is to improve um, pharmacotherapy and to optimize patient adherence. So we have had this uh, cohort event monitoring for about 12 years now. Yes, time is flying. Um, and first we started to have the inclusion of the cohorts in the pharmacies. Now we have moved 
out of the pharmacies. We still have some inclusion in the pharmacies, but depending on the type of drug that we want to monitor, sometimes we have inclusions in the general practitioner's office. If it is for vaccines, we have it in the health facilities that do uh, vaccination for the babies. And some products are mainly used in the hospital, so then we would have the inclusion in the hospitals. So depending on the type of drug that we want to follow, we have different inclusion products. Um, we use the patient as the source of information. So we don't rely on healthcare professional information, but we ask patients directly uh, about their experiences. We use web-based questionnaires, so people are sent emails at certain uh, time intervals where they can answer the questionnaires. And we also ask several time, um, times uh, in a row in a questionnaire, because then we can also follow how the ADRs develop. So if you would uh, report an ADR in questionnaire one, then we would ask in questionnaire two, how did it go with the ADR that you had in question one, questionnaire one? Have you recovered or what have you done? And have you recovered or not recovered? So that's the... Um, I think the strength of collecting um, longitudinal data, when you collect data at more time points, that you can actually also see what is happening with ADRs over time. Uh, so this is a bit the things that we want to be able to answer when we do our intensive monitoring. The frequency in real life, because most of the frequencies that are known are frequencies from clinical trials. Um, also the time course of ADRs. So uh, how long does it persist? Do you need to stop? And if you stop, how long does it take before it disappears? I think that's very essential for patients to know about this when they are using drugs. Also, the management of ADRs. So what should I do if I get this ADR? Should I stop or not continue? Can I use some other drug or do anything to alleviate my ADR? Uh, also hope to find information about risk factors for ADR. Are there certain characteristics in patients developing these ADRs? And also get the feeling for the quality of life and the severity of ADR. So how patient perceives the ADRs and what impact it has on their lives. Because often when we do our business case for pharmacovigilance, we talk about um, so and so many people are hospitalized because of ADRs and that costs us so and so much money. A lot of ADRs are not serious, so it wouldn't lead to hospitalization, but they are very severe, which makes the people might consume more care. They have to go to the doctor, maybe they have to take other drugs. Maybe they're also so severe that you cannot work, which means that you have lack of income during the time that you, um, uh, that you are suffering this, this. Or it also leads to a, a lower quality of life, which is also um, very important for patients, but it's very difficult to measure monies. So we are also trying to get other parameters which measures the impact of ADRs. But if you are interested in uh, cohort event monitoring, if you're interested in our um, intensive monitoring systems, you're more than welcome to ask me, because this was also the subject of my thesis that I defended about six years ago now. Yes. So, to wrap things up, and I think I have five, five minutes. Before I wrap up, do you have questions at this point? Because I think it's important that I answer your questions. Yes, I see a question there. Not, not a question, but I think it, it's, it's a comment. When you say the, um, the, same, the one that the mm -hmm. mutual recommend for TB and new molecule, mm -hmm. I, I think I'll agree for you uh, with what you say, like you said, targeted mm -hmm. uh, spontaneous but i think there are elements that are beyond the targeted when you talk about yes. active money so i think it's, it's filling that space between the perhaps the targeted reporting and the core event monitoring mm -hmm. but making it a little bit practical yeah. that you can fill in the pro so i think that's that's a very specific in niche that yes. adsm uh, yes. occupies and i also think it's dependent on which package adsm if you, you choose for the most um the largest package then you have a cohort event monitoring yes. system. If you have only chooses for the smallest, which is the serious, you are in the targeting zone, but more towards the spontaneous reporting form. And if you have the, the, the intermediate package with also the adverse events of different interests, then you are really in the targeted spontaneous reporting. So it's also a spectrum. But I'm very glad that we are in discussion with each other because I think that's very important 
that public health programs and pharma commissions are in discussion because really the method doesn't matter so much, but what you do with the information that you collect with this method, that's very important, how you share that and how you use that for decision making within your program, but also what the regulators do with it. So I think that's just, just the key. Thank you. Other comments and questions? I think I'll stop there. What I have here are just two slides which puts um, the characteristics of each method um, between each other, so then you can also see it. And uh, in the end, I don't know, do they get the slides uh, on a stick or so? Then I also have some, some questions, so then you can think about, in some cases, which methods you will use. But I think it's very important, when, you, when we talk about methods, that you think, what do I want to know? And that should be the starting point, and not, oh, I want to do a chem study. No, you should start, what do I want to know? And then you also need to think about what is the feasibility for me to implement this method in my setting. Because maybe you say, oh, I want to do this and this. Oh, well, I want to know this, and then chem would be the best. But then you would also need to see, do you have the resources and the infrastructure in the, your, your country to do chem? Or can you maybe better do a targeted spontaneous reporting? So begin with the question, and then the feasibility. And then you can make your choices. Thank you very much for your attention.